Uh, with this introduction, I can only disappoint you. Uh, <laughs> so, so I will try my best not that it doesn't look too bad. So, um, uh, indeed, I have the, the pleasure of um, leading a wonderful research group. Um, we are about 15 uh, there, about 10 PhD students. And uh, it's really an uh, interdisciplinary adventure uh, going from computer science, uh, physics, energy, um, and of course architecture to try to address this uh, daylight performance challenge um, that I would like to talk to you today a little bit more about. So if we uh, look at what we really mean by uh, addressing the daylighting challenge, it is about the interface between the inside and the outside, right? The difficult thing is that the outside changes all the time, and inside we want to make things relatively stable so that we can perform our tasks. What I think is interesting in that is to take it from a human perspective, from the occupant's perspective. What do we need to achieve to make us comfortable, happy, healthy, uh, and uh, enjoying our spaces? And this is really, or has become, a focus of, of the lab. So uh, if we really start with the interface um, as such, the interface is usually the facade. And so the facade can produce many different lighting patterns, depending on the technology that we use, the shape we give it, the texture, uh, the uh, materials, and so on. And so it already impacts a lot what uh, you can see through, and then how light is distributed, uh, and therefore what kind of atmosphere it creates inside. So an approach to analyze this, and this is actually the approach I started with uh, during my PhD, was a very technical approach, or almost optical approach. And so it is to look at it from Okay, where does the light go from a physical standpoint? And uh, so I worked a lot with uh, BTDFs and BRDFs, uh, whatever these acronyms mean, bidirectional transmission reflection functions. Uh, ba basically, where does the light go depending on where it comes from? Okay, and then we can uh, start to go further into applying these optical functions to what they mean in terms of space. One uh, difficulty, even when we just consider the, um, the facade component or their physical uh, properties is to make this technology accessible to those who have to choose them. So we developed uh, a web-based tool that is able to uh, select appropriate advanced technologies depending on whether you want, for example, deepening light penetration and working as a separate layer or inside the, the facade itself, and then having some information with these scale models pictures as to what this technology really does for you. So this would be trying to take the designer's perspective as to how to make it easier for them to choose the right technology. But this was really, or is, I mean, it still exists, you can find the website here, is really driven by the physicality of the component and not really focusing so much on the occupant. So if we look at these very advanced technologies and be a little more critical about them, we can uh, ask ourselves the question of, uh, a forgiveness factor. Once we start having high tech and really uh, have an influence on how what we expect the light to do is not what it's doing, we redirect it, we change its color, we make it a different pattern, then there is the question of how much of this is acceptable to uh, occupants, even though it might be fine in terms of flux, where the flux goes to illuminate the space, there might be a question of whether this is actually perceived as an improvement of the space in terms of atmosphere and learning environment, like um, Inke was saying before. And so we can uh, start to have a, a feed-in loop of the, character the characteristics themselves, so a little bit what I showed just before, and then how the building is actually operated, but also how the occupants actually perceive the technology and work in a feedback loop to make sure that the actual facade contributes positively to the experience of the user. So this would bring these facade design questions closer to the occupant's perspective. And so if we now really focus on the design, uh, sorry, on the daylight aspects, what we like to do is to uh, look at what is already mainstream, and then of course this is the point of research, go a little bit beyond it. And so um, one thing that is very particular about daylight is its dynamic nature. It's the fact that it changes all the time. So this makes it very tough because it's hard to control, and when we try to avoid negative instances, it's a nuisance that it's uh, changing all the time. However, if we take other aspects of maybe the benefits of this daylight dynamics, the dynamics of it, 
this might not be a nuisance to avoid, but a benefit to increase. And so this is also a change in thinking that we would like to instill also in research, that it's not just about avoiding to be uncomfortable with daylight, but also enjoying what it brings us on top of other, or even on top of, or complementary to um, electrifying. So what research and really practice has been working a lot with, uh, I would say are these um, approaches, the, what we call mainstream performance metrics. So for example, make sure we can perform a task. And so this is about illumination, and the most common metric is illuminance on the work plane, making sure we have 300 lux, 500 lux, depends on your standards, uh, to make sure that you can work on your desk. There has been, although it's a little less uh, mainstream in practice, because it's quite difficult to evaluate, it's view dependent, uh, very time dependent, as daylight usually is, it's very uh, heavy in terms of data because it's luminance maps, so it's a different kind of metric. This is about glare, and here again we want to avoid being uncomfortable, and we have some glare metrics, amongst which daylight glare probability, that um, most of you probably know, uh, about uh, telling when it is becoming unbearably or intolerably, this is the right uh, terminology, um, uncomfortable. And then, of course, a lot of effort has been put on energy or on uh, both managing the solar gains issue with daylight and on uh, electric lighting savings that we can do by properly complementing or getting both together to work together. So we have great tools that work on energy, and yet there is maybe a little bit of a lack of a deep understanding of what the needs really are. Do we really need 300 lux all year round? Actually, no, we need also some variability because otherwise we would be very happy in windowless rooms, all in this room, all year long, all day long. Would we be happy? I would be particularly unhappy. Uh, I hope you can go for another 30 minutes, but uh, this is uh, not something uh, that we really want. Why? Because we miss the connection to the outside. So it's not just about having 300 lux, although we don't have them right here, but even if with slightly higher levels, this is not what we want. And we had an era, once we had an invented, they had invented fluorescent lighting and air conditioning. Okay, let's get rid of the environment. We just stick to comfortable temperature, 21 degrees Celsius, 300 lux, 500, whatever, and this is the best. But it's not. We need this variability. We need this connection to the outside. So uh, we, we can look at other aspects uh, that are more human-driven, about health, about behavior, how do we react to a certain light environment, and uh, how do we perceive it? What is exciting or interesting about a space that uh, is dated or lit in general? And so, uh, for example, one uh, research area, this is not a simulation done by us, it is, um, I thank the Studio Ola for lesson for providing us such a powerful way to show that by looking at different colored lighting, we may experience a sense of a difference in temperature. I don't know if you did when you looked at the blue versus the green or the red, but it is not impossible that by uh, being in a different colored environment, we think, we perceive, we feel that the temperature has changed, and of course it hasn't. Uh, so the, there is then a question that we are currently investigating with a, a PhD student in particular, Georgia Kinazzo, who is about the interaction between thermal perception and visual perception. So is there an effect on the thermal perception of having a glary environment? Do we feel more or less warm when we are in a glary environment? Or on the opposite, when we feel experience glare, are we more sensitive to the temperature? Or if it's a colored light, do we feel more or less warm, etc.? So if this is the case, that means we have to think further in our comfort models and make them dynamic because they influence one another. We don't, know, we don't have the answer yet, but it is not impossible that there is an interaction, and therefore that we could go further in these models by making them interact with one another. And so how we uh, try to do this is, of course, we need controlled studies. This is what we do in research in general, so it's usually somewhat boring spaces uh, to start with, uh, where we can fully control that there is only one parameter that changes at a time, and that, for example, temperature is maintained constant, while the color is changing by changing films um, uh, with, the, uh, with the glazing, and yet not diminishing the overall <coughs> brightness, the photopic brightness, uh, the number of lux you would get in the, on a plane, uh, or to have a more or less glary environment, and again, see if there is an effect on temperature, and then if the brightness itself, without changing the color this time, has an effect on perceived temperature, not on temperature itself. And so 
to do that with uh, a different range of temperature and different range of these uh, conditions. So this allows us to look at this impact. On the other hand, we want to go further into contrast evaluation. So this is another PhD student named uh, Peter Hansen, who uh, is working on um, uh, connecting the glare perception with contrast. So the current metric, daylight glare probability, is, I mean, every metric has a limit. Its limit here is that it is very correlated with the brightness overall. So if you have a contrasted space that has a low brightness overall, the DGP will tell you that it is not glary. However, we do experience glare in dim environment when there is a lot of contrast, and the current glare metric cannot reveal that. So again, there is uh, an interest to push this a little further and see if we can quantify the amount of contrast that leads to a glare perception, even in a low lit, um, a, a not so bright environment, a dim uh, environment. And so, um, uh, a former PhD student who, who has become a postdoc and is now in Stockholm um, in a consulting firm worked on the dynamics of the gains response, so the view direction response, as a function of lighting conditions to see if, depending on the lighting conditions and on the task that you perform, you have a different view behavior, a different places <laughs> that you look mostly. And it seems there is. Not so surprisingly, but it's interesting to be able to quantify it. And how do we quantify it? Because we really want to know if the field of view changes. Well, it changes a lot. So this is accumulation of all the uh, spots that we look at while performing a task in this somewhat boring office. We look everywhere, basically. The question is how much we look in each direction, of course. This seems to be very homogeneous. We don't look everywhere the same amount. So we um, used uh, eye tracking to uh, monitor the uh, eye direction. And here, depending on the task, so thinking, we are quite scattered. Responding to the screen, we look at the screen. Typing, we also look at the keyboard. Talking on the phone, we look everywhere again. And waiting, we look even further. Uh, or responding to questions, um, it's a lot of thinking process too, and then reflecting as well. And then here, when you see the colors, they correspond actually to a level of brightness in the room which is kind of an average of the luminance map uh, that the person was facing. And therefore, there was actually a connection between the brightness and the pattern of gaze, where we look. And if we try to summarize them quite um, uh, really in a synthetic way, basically, what it showed, maybe we are not, will not be so surprised, but if we have the opportunity, we will direct our gaze preferably to the brighter areas, like the window, um, if the task allows us to do so. If we have to type, and really we have to look at the screen, of course, while we type, we are not looking at the window. But as soon as we are a little freer, we tend to be biased towards a brighter area. However, when this bright area becomes too bright, then we avoid, of course, the bright area and tend to look in a, in, in a direction that is just far enough to not have this glary um, uh, perception in our uh, main field of view, let's say. So this was, in a nutshell, what uh, was found out. And what was good is to now start to have frequency and numbers and really a way to talk about this in a more objective way and not just about, I think we do more or this. This was uh, just a measurement with about 100 uh, people. Um, uh, in the, this was actually conducted in Freiburg in uh, Germany. And so then comes the question of how to represent it, how to communicate this. This is quite complex um, to someone who has to make decisions about the space. And so we um, uh, took uh, the example, this is just for illustration purposes, um, a, a house, uh, the Neugebau house um, by Richard Mayer that is built in uh, Miami. And we moved it virtually to Reykjavik in Iceland to make it really extreme. And then to uh, assess lighting conditions in that sort of virtual space or real space put in a virtual place to see how to talk, how to communicate about these uh, change of view direction as a function of uh, glare. And so this uh, blue vector, so to speak, indicates where we have a tendency to move away from the straight view because of light or because of a glare source. And so in a dynamic way, so this would be for June 21st in Reykjavik, so a very, very long day, uh, we see that this vector is biased 
towards uh, the uh, right, so to avoid the, in this case, excessive glare region. Uh, all these blue dots, they each correspond to a single glare uh, source. There are many glare sources, there are many blue dots floating around. Uh, we can find ways to summarize the information a little more. On December 21st, it is even more extreme because the sun is much lower. It's there for a very short amount of time, but when it's there, it's really there. Uh, because it comes almost horizontally. And so here you have a huge amount of uh, daylight pouring in in an uncomfortable way and therefore a, 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 a strong bias um, avoiding the, uh, this excessive uh, amount of uh, daylight.